we have Larry Owens coming in this afternoon, but um, this morning um, our pages came to me and said they had some additional information, um, both about some additional information about yesterday and then some additional information that they learned today from the um, youth lobby, I think that's what they're yeah. calling themselves. So what I would suggest is um, just pull up two more chairs and sit at the end of the table here with us like, like witnesses. And Gail, let's record this. Oh, okay. Well, the, the committee's record, we're um, supposed to record everything so that if somebody <coughs> wanted to find out, we are on the record. When Cindy is here, we are on the record. Oh, look, and she even now says that. Mm -hmm. But then if somebody really wants to know what happened here or here and they couldn't be here, they can ask for the, uh, well, I shouldn't say tape anymore, should I CD? What do they ask? Whatever they ask for. That's what they just the copy of the recording. Yeah, they can, they can have that. So, so welcome. And once again, um, you've seen this happen so many times. Just identify yourselves for the record, and then after that, when every time you speak, you don't have to identify who you are. So I'm Chip Jung. I'm Nora O'Grady. I'm Madison Keenard. Yep. Okay. So, what would you like to tell us today? So, uh, well, first, an update on the um, Extinction Rebellion. Wait, mm -hmm. you know this one? Yeah. Yeah. I read a news article, um, and it was about how the terrorism police. Um, declared that the Extinction Rebellion was an extremist ideology. Where? In yes, what country? In our country? Um, they're a global organization, oh. I believe. Oh. No, but which group said they were terrorist organization? Um, it wasn't specific, but it said a group of um, terrorism police. So I'm not sure how accurate this article was, but I thought it was interesting enough to update. Yeah. yeah. So they've been targeted as, I mean, they've been identified by someone now as a terrorist organization. Oh, not necessarily, just as an extremist ideology. Oh, okay, um, great. And then, um, so then, the, this uh, youth lobby, that's their logo. On a happier note. Yeah, <laughs> they're um, not as extreme as... Uh, they and were, they're a Vermont specific group. Yeah, oh. and they were a lot more civil than um, Extinction Rebellion. Yeah. Today they did a press conference and they even out and that's how we kind of heard about them. Um, would you then, would you just go back to the logo again here? Yeah. So that's a hand holding up a portion of the earth. Is that what they're holding up? It's there? just like a hand it's, with it's the like earth a as a background. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. The the, oh, I see. It's the global workers unite this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Slaver Good. Thank you. So then, and then this is their mission. So. Their mission is to uh, to help from across Vermont. Real, wait. To help youth from across Vermont realize their truth, their true power to affect significant change through responsible, informed collective action and civil discourse, and find a and find a way to channel to channel their concerns about their future in a uh, productive way. And then. What kind of discourse did you say? Civil. Yes. Civil. That's what I thought. You and said. then another um, one of the members, we asked them, and they, she said, um, we advocate. Oh, thank you. She said, we advocate for stronger. This is uh, a quote from one of the members. We advocate for stronger climate action at the Senate level by talking to at the state level. Sorry, by talking to lawmakers and holding um, events to show the urgency of the climate crisis. So did you, did you, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just asked, did you go to their press conference? I was okay. there the entire time he was there for part of it. Yeah, I was there for the first time. Yeah. And did you go to the youth summit this fall? Um, I went to the climate strike this fall, but I didn't go to the youth summit. Because I went to the youth summit, which was very interesting. It was very impressive to see these young people organizing as well as they did. It was uh, inspiring. Speaking of which, um, the ages of the group um, range from middle school age to college age, but um, we saw several members who were younger than middle school age, but yeah. they're not official. And they're also adults, but I think they're mainly just there to organize my drive thinking. 
parents. I think some of the adults you saw were actually their teachers. Uh -huh. Yeah, like one of the, um, the same member that we told you the to quote by, she said that she, um, she had been lobbying and do doing stuff like that for, not lobbying, but like doing work to help for climate change like since she was little. But then when she's a senior now and this year, she heard about it from um, one of her teachers who recommended that she join and now she's a member. And then um, they have, it, other than like events like this and stuff, they have regular meetings uh, in Montpelier or Waterbury once a month. And she was also saying how, um, what was the other thing that she said? Oh yeah. They're not a climate specific group, though in recent years they've been focusing more on um, the climate crisis. They also focus on um, lowering the voting age to 16 and Oh, um, they, for climate, they work on the climate strike, rally for the planet, and climate congress. They also work with jobs such as trial stewards and then the VPIRG, and then justice, race against racism, and team voting. And she was saying, um, the girl that we had interviewed, she said that um, the organization has been going on for about six years. She said not quite ten, but around that sort of time frame. And then this is a video on their website of what they show, like, um, several bills that they thought um, were either good or could use some amendments to make them better and protect our climate. Mm -hmm. Something I really noticed was that a lot of groups, it, uh, whether they were like them or Extinction Rebellion or whatever, they have ideas of when they want certain things to happen, certain changes in the climate and like um, our like pollution and stuff to happen. But their timing isn't very realistic. But this group, their timing is extremely realistic of when they think, like, it's, like the timing when they think we can actually get this stuff done makes more sense than some other groups that I've heard. And they put a lot of thought into it, like a lot more than some groups that are mainly adults and they're all kids. Yeah, the approach that they, they're taking is a lot different, I think, than the group that we had seen yesterday because they sort of had planned, like they came into the um, state house and they had planned out the press conference ahead of time and meeting with certain people so that they knew what they wanted to do and who to talk to to get things done. They were in touch with all of us uh, who have been very involved with their m movement and who are involved in committee leadership and asked if they could come into our committees to present their uh, petition. And sadly, they talked about some very good economic development, but, but it was, I, they, they, they did it in several. They showed up in the Senate Agriculture. Good. Yeah. I thought their press conference was really well thought mm -hmm. out, and um, they had a lot of really good points. And like, like, I don't know about you guys, but I recognize people who are in it 
Yeah, I did too. I don't think there's actually a chapter for South Burlington or Burlington. So then they have like mini, like almost like you like chapters is how they describe them, like mini parts of it in different schools. So there are people from all over the state. Like some some people that I know are in it, like up there. No. And I talked to another girl, and she said they're working on expanding to make it more yeah, statewide. Yeah, we talked to a man who was trying to get more people actually from South Burlington to join because they wanted to get more people from all over. When they have a chapter in, in a school like that, do they have to have a, a teacher that will sponsor the chapter? Is that the way it works? Do you know? Um, I don't believe it's necessary to have a teacher. They told me if I was interested, um, I should get a group of people who are interested. And the more people you have, the more necessary it um, is for a teacher to join. Uh -huh. So I think the students come first, and then the um, teacher organizer. So I'm just wondering, do you, did you prefer what the, the, the youth lobby did today to what the Extinction Rebellion people did? Mm -hmm. But of course, I got, I got that message. But I'm wondering, do you see a role for both kinds of activities? I mean, yeah. I mean, can you understand what I'm saying? Like, some people want to do it this way, some people want to do it that way. Is that, do you sort of see a, is that a useful thing to think about? Or is it just say no to the people we don't want to hear from? I think, oh, go ahead. I think we should listen to everyone. But I really, I think. What was done today was more productive. Um, they told us they were coming every Friday in the session. So they also have resilience like the other group tried to show, but this is more thought out and it's planned. So I just think it was better executed. And like I feel like if they're trying to work with the politicians and with all the people in the government, um, and I think Extinction was Rebellion was looking at them more of an enemy not as like a, a partner to get stuff done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, because um, I, for many years, have worked in the media. You were all here when the event happened yesterday. And then I don't know whether you bothered to see television reports about it or read uh, newspaper articles about it. How well do you think the media did covering what you saw? A lot of times, someone will see something and have form an opinion and then they'll read about that in a paper later or see it on TV and go, well, that wasn't really what happened. So I'm curious whether it was portrayed the right way on, on the state's media, if you maybe didn't watch it, I don't know. Well, I know after we um, left to take like a break while they were removing the protesters, um, I think a bunch of us just went around to see if what was happening while we were gone. And um, the most accurate thing was obviously the videos that they had had of what happened. But um, we did listen into the VPR, or I did, with a couple of people. And I think that was nice because you could actually hear what the people in there were watching, and they were sort of describing it to you. I didn't physically read an article, so I don't know if that person sort of Sometimes when you summarize things, it's harder to get yeah. everything out. And so I think one thing that they did well was when, with the VPR, I thought they did a good job describing it. Because they just stream it, right? Right, so you, yeah. instead of telling you what's happening, they're just showing it yeah. to you. Right. You can decide for yourself kind of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yes, people who were on the feed were hearing the whole thing. Right, right. Yeah. But they also then summarized on the news mm -hmm. what had happened and had sound clips yeah. also. And I, I, I saw the CAX, the coverage last night, late last night, which uh, sadly ended up being more about the protest than the speech. I was just going to make That's that point. Happened. Which was, which was from their point of view, very successful. Right. I, you know, if, if, if something that is about something else ends up being about this other thing that get hijacks it, right. then that was a very successful dis, dis, disturbance. Right. right. So. From a media point of view, to go to Brian's point, it was a for the rest of Vermont. They what did they learn? They learned there was a disruption, and that the governor's speech was disrupted for 20 minutes. Last night I watched it on the news after, and like like you said, like they didn't really. And I think they should have kept. Like they should have talked about the beginning of the speech. They talked about when that happened, 
And then, like, when they're done talking about the, like, nothing else that had to do with that really happened after right. the protest. So they should have been finished talking about the protest and then continue talking about the points of the speech. Because, like, they don't want to, like, they, because then, like, the protesters don't care if they get kicked out or anything. Right. They want to get, they want everyone to understand their message. So they should have kept going along with, like, yeah. the, um, with what the speech was about. So sadly, I think actually the impact was much more substantial than those of us who were here because uh, CAX spent more time on them and on who was arrested afterwards because it followed them in the lobby than on um, the speech. I there were 15 detained and I think one arrest. Right. Yeah, I mean, in the news business, it used to be if it bleeds, it leads. Right. That was the, yeah. the, the, the phrase. So that whenever there's something, you don't ever do a story about the cat successfully coming down from the tree by itself. It's always if somebody rescues the cat. That's the story. So it's the similar kind of thing here, where, as Allison correctly points out, I think the speech was overshadowed by, and I'll do, use my own term, misbehavior, uh, more so than maybe it needed to be. But anyway, that's that's okay. But I was just curious how you guys felt about that. I think so. <laughs> I think the group the group knew beforehand that if they were um, escorted out and if they're arrested, there would be more media coverage. Yeah. And yeah. I feel like a lot of that was very intentional. Yeah, yeah. And, I yeah think, and I think they knew they were going to get kicked out. Yeah. That was part of the plan. I so. heard it was almost identical to what happened last year with the exception of um, a banner being unfurled. Yeah, that's right. well, we did, there wasn't a disruption last year. Yeah, well, in the house. It was, it was two years ago. No. It, it was two. It, it, are you talking about the one in the house? I'm talking about the one with Sean. The last big one was with Sean. He had one, and then Phil Scott's had two. Yeah. Yeah, but the first one was pretty modest. Yeah, it was pretty. But, yeah. But it, the different, one of the differences between the, um, this one, and I give credit to the kids who were there yesterday for doing this. I mean, I know they wanted to be escorted out and everything, but when, when there was a recess and they were escorted out, they followed the the rules. I mean, they they left. They did they did go out in the Shumlin one during his inaugural speech. They did not leave, and in right. fact, they they a group of people came and sat on the floor yeah. in the well of the house there, so nobody could get out and, and occupy the house basically. and occupied the house until nine o'clock that night when they were going to lock up and. And then they had to physically remove people. And in fact, one of my constituents has a suit against the state for that. But, but so that yesterday, they, they, they achieved being escorted out, but they actually did follow the, the rules when, when they were asked to leave. So that was to their credit. And like, like you said, they followed the rules, and no one was watching what they followed. Yeah, like they like they didn't care. Like when when the governor said like sit down, they didn't care because they because everyone was watching. But then the second everyone stops watching it, it's not going to get on the news. Right. They go along with whatever they say. I think like their approach was different because well, um, theirs was more with a sense of urgency towards yeah. the issue, which both are effective and both are important. So I mean, you have to give credit to them too yeah. for what they're they're doing it for. Both are different ways, but equally as important to the cause. I think. So, which which approach do you think Greta would have supported? Um, that's a hard question. It is hard. Youth lobby because yeah. she comes because she helps come up with plans on how to fix it, uh -huh. and I don't think the I don't think Extinction Rebellion was really thinking about like how to fix. They were just thinking it needs to be fixed, not. We can help by coming up with plans to fix this. But you thought we had like a plan. Like, we can do this and this and this. I feel like her approach was somewhat in between because she did call out um, the world leaders mm -hmm. for not doing enough, but she also um, like issued a call to action for other people mm -hmm. um, and raised a lot of awareness, um, a lot of positive awareness for the issue. So in that, it was similar to the youth lobbyists. I would agree. I think 
she's maybe more on the side of the youth lobby, but I think sort of somewhere in between because she does um, use both tactics, I think, in the way she um, promotes climate change awareness. So. Part of good um, advocacy is knowing when to use which tactic. Yeah. I think she's very good about that. Mm -hmm. I take it you're all fans. Yes. Yeah. She's a pretty impressive, isn't she? Yeah. Very moving to to watch somebody with who has overcome so many disabilities to yeah. uh, be such a force of nature. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we very well, well, change your eyes you and ears in the state house because we couldn't have been at the youth summit today. Right. Yeah. We were all on committee, so yeah. we are really grateful to you for keeping us current. Thank you. Okay. And on yeah. other issues too, really. Yeah. I'm, we're serious. If there are things that you think that we're missing out on that are, let us know. And if if it's something that we have time for, we'll. Now, can you come in? Before they leave, before you leave, you guys were, um, you were, I overheard you say that you didn't know what our mission of our committee was. So we would like to tell you what our commission, our, what our mission is. What do we oversee? What are our responsibilities? Anything we want to do. <laughs> we, we're, we look at the structure of government, but we, as state employees, law enforcement, um, I don't even remember because Brian calls it, um, Senator Colomar has suffrage. Suffrage, yeah, elections, voting. We do elections, we do uh, all the amendments to the Constitution. No, we don't do all the amendments well, to the we, Constitution. That's true, we don't. We do the ones that relate to the <laughs> business. That's true. We do the we, we, we like. But we, because we are the Government Operations Committee, our feeling is that anything that has to do with the operation of the government, if no one else will do it, we will do it. So Senator Colomar called, instead of saying we deal with health issues on the health committee, we deal with ag issues on the ag, he calls us the surprise a day committee. <laughs> but, you know, you may have met the new, um, what do we call it, the, the director of, of racial diversity who's looking at systemic racism. We created that position in this committee. And that uh, we over and we oversee local state government. We oversee how government works together. We have a, a pretty wide. Did you say charters yet? Yeah. Charters, <laughs> yeah. and, and, charters. And if some other committee won't do it, we in do the it. sense of, at one point there was a bill to set up, to establish medical marijuana dispensaries because. Um, People who needed it as a medicine had no place to go. And this elderly woman said, what am I supposed to do, ask my grandson to go buy some pot for me in the school? And she didn't want to do that. So we, but this bill was not going to be taken up by health and welfare. It just wasn't, they weren't going to do it. So we took it in here. We did it. We have nothing to do with dispensaries or marijuana or anything else, but whatever we want to do. So. <laughs> I, wait, I have a question. So sure. um, each page has to choose a, a bill, a mm -hmm. Senate bill, and a House bill, and do like a short paper on it. And mine was about the Senate proposal to amend the Constitution, giving the governor a four-year term. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there are a couple of those. Yeah. Are you That's, guys involved in that one? We are. Yes. We have that one. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But you should come talk to me about it if you want to do something, because I'm not sure we're going to do anything with it. OK. Thank but you. we, um, if, if, you're, if that's what you're going to follow, we could have a discussion of it. I'll set okay. that up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you just make a copy of that chip and then bring that Yeah. Okay. What is that? It's, it's our, our mission. It's charge. Oh, good. Cool. We have it on the board. Constitutional charge. Where is Thank, it? You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Should we start? Yes. No. Okay. So I just should we come come? just to close the door. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, um, so we're we just want to have a general conversation. We know that, um, and we're going to have. I believe next week we're going to actually take up the the two bills that we currently have in here on the ethics commission. Okay. And. Um, we're going to try and have a, a lot of 
testimony then, we also invited Paul Burns to come and tell us why we should just can you. Uh, Fair enough. <laughs> but you didn't hear, read the article? No, I somehow missed that. You said if you're going to have a, yeah. an ethics commission that can't do anything, you might as well just get rid of it. So I disagree with him, but anyway, well, here I'm we are. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Hi, good afternoon. How are you all? Good. Happy to hear. Um, Larry Novins, for the record. Um, I had asked originally, we tried to get together with uh, Senator White, we kept missing each other, and so she invited me to come in and talk to the committee, and thank you for the, for the chance. I spoke to Senator Polina last, uh, I guess it was late summer, early fall, and kind of outlined what we've been doing the last year and what I've seen in my observations over the last year, and then what my, my goals are for the future. So I'll sort of briefly outline what I've seen and, and let you know that our annual report will be ready and will be filed next week. So it goes into it in pretty excruciating detail, I think. Um, so what I've seen, it, we had about 23 complaints last year, and they were against uh, all versions of state government, legislators, statewide officers, state employees, uh, members of state boards and commissions, uh, so it covered the gamut. We also received, I think, about six complaints uh, that were against municipalities or uh, sort of quasi-autonomous regulatory bodies that aren't officially part of the state but exist out there. Um, and in seeing these complaints, certain things became obvious pretty quickly. The complaints that alleged anything that looked fairly serious were referred as they are to be referred under the statute, uh, either to the AG's office or the Professional Responsibility Board or the Department of Human Services, uh, resources, I'm sorry. And uh, we had one complaint against, uh, uh, it was a member of the municipal, I'm sorry, judicial branch, but that person had since left, um, so it didn't make any sense to refer that. Um, what I found out is when we get a complaint, if we were to get a complaint against the governor, the lieutenant governor, secretary of state, auditor of accounts, attorney general, or treasurer, the only place under the statute where we can send those is if it's criminal conduct to the AG's office. And if it's anything regular by law, then we'd send it over to Department of Human Resources, who would look at it and investigate it and send us a letter back saying, we have no authority over those people. So there's no there's no oversight over those over those people and, and uh, six people in government who arguably have the most responsibility mm -hmm. and the most authority. So that was a surprise to me. So the statewide um, office holders. statewide office holders. Mm -hmm. And then um, we had I think one or two complaints against the state boards or commissions. And right now there are 180. I think, according to the governor's website, I counted 175, their website this afternoon said 180 boards and commissions. If we were to get a complaint against uh, the parole board or the natural resources board or the medical practice board or the uh, public utilities commission, human services board, we would take those complaints, send them over to DHR, which is the only place they could go unless it was criminal conduct. And they would look at it, review it, compare it to what they have, and they'd send it back to us, and they'd say, those people aren't state employees. Mm -hmm. We have no authority over them. Well, can, why would you not send it to the, oh, because it isn't in the statute, but I'm thinking, why wouldn't you send it to the appointing authority? Because it's not in the because statute. Because it's not in the statute. Right. Got it. And so the appointing authority for all the boards and commissions is governor. Um, for most of them, anyway. Right. And under the, the, the code that applies to them, the eth whatever the equivalent of an ethics code that applies to them, is the governor's executive order, uh, which doesn't have the force of law. It's an executive order. It could be modified or changed at any time. And according to its own terms, the person who enforces that is the governor. So if we had a complaint, if there was a complaint against somebody on one of those boards who was doing the kind of thing that under the ethics code would not be permitted, you know, using your office for personal gain, that kind of thing, having a conflict of interest, it would be up to the governor, according to the executive um, order, to enforce that. And I think if it was somebody in a board or commission using the copy machine to make their Christmas cards, 
I would hope the governor had better things to do. So we have this huge number of, of people who act in the name of the state of Vermont on these boards and commissions. And these people are granting licenses, denying licenses, State Board of Education, Public Utilities Commission making huge decisions. And there's really no oversight for them and no place to go for ethical complaints. That was another thing we, we found out this year. Um, one of the other problems that we have is under the current statute, it says that we are to accept complaints about government ethics in any of the three branches of government. And then the other part of the statute says, well, what do you do with these complaints? It says we can refer complaints um, that are violations of the Department of Human Resources Code of Ethics, which there really isn't one, and we've put in in our proposed bill to fix that. It's really a policies and procedures manual. Um, but apart from those violations, the only thing we can refer to DHR is conduct or violations of conduct regulated by law. So unless there's a specific statute that's violated by somebody's unethical conduct, I can't refer to that. So if I got the complaint about somebody using public office for their own personal benefit, unless there's a statute pr proscribing that conduct, I can't refer. Um, so there are huge gaps in terms of what is considered to be ethical or unethical conduct in Vermont and what can actually be referred from our office to other people for enforcement. And then there's the third part, which is the limitations that DH, uh, Department of Human Resources has in terms of what they can and cannot enforce. They cannot enforce our ethics code. Our ethics code was, as you know, adopted by the commission in consultation with the department. Um, <clears throat> so it's essentially people sitting around a table about this big and coming up with a code, which is, I think, a good code, and I think it, could, it should be the model for a, you know, a statutory code of ethics, but it doesn't have the force of law, and it can't be enforced. So that's another problem. If we said we have a violation of our code and we set it over DHR, DHR they'd say, well, we can't enforce that. Um, assuming that the person who was complained against, the subject of the complaint, was someone under their jurisdiction, somebody that they had authority to do something with. If we get complaints against lawyers, we have to refer those to the Professional Responsibility Board. And we've referred a couple complaints to them, and they don't have authority to discipline lawyers for violations of the state ethics code. They can sanction lawyers for violations of the rules of professional uh, responsibility, which are in many ways narrower. So it would be a violation for me to use my position as a state employee for my own personal gain. It wouldn't be a violation of the ethics rules that the lawyers are bound by. And if they saw that complaint, they would say, there's nothing we can do about this. It's not a violation of our code. So a lot of the kind of conduct that one would normally think it should be an ethics concern and, or an ethics violation, even if it is referred to somebody else, isn't within their jurisdiction. So we have huge gaping holes yeah. in what we have. Um, so it took me probably about three or four months to really appreciate the, the gravity of the situation. I mean, really we have uh, an ethics code and ethics oversight in Vermont that, uh, here's the way I like to put it, it leaves us lots of room for growth. <laughs> uh, there's, there's plenty we can do to make it better. Um, and, and so our hope and our, my goal uh, and the commission's goal for the future is to say, okay, what do we do with this? You know, we get municipal client complaints, and we've got some serious ones that we can't do anything about. The Secretary of State's office under Act 79, 79? 179, it is supposed to report to us about the complaints they did. They, and they, they wrote to us, and we have a brief outline of that in our annual report. They get lots of, of complaints. There's a lot of serious stuff going on that is going unaddressed. and. At this time, I'm not saying give us authority to, to look at those things. I've seen a couple of those complaints, and the resources it would take to fully investigate them and figure out what to do with them is way beyond 
certainly beyond where we are now and beyond where we might conceivably, conceivably be in the near future. Um, so that's, that's another issue for us. So what we've done is we've sort of come up with a three-stage plan of what I think is a good approach to trying to fix this and make ethics oversight for Vermont meaningful. Um, what I have called phase one is what we sent over to House Government Operations, and it's a proposal to change our current statute um, to make some modifications to it. And most of it's kind of tweaking things. There are a few things in there that, is that everybody here? Good. Good. Um, there are a few things in there that, that struck out as just being, uh, I think, mistakes. Um, and there were a couple that were sort of policy things. I can go through them very briefly if you like. But the big one, the one that, that I feel most is, is most crying for attention right now is what we're asking for, and this is what is in Senator Bellina's bill, is we're asking that the commission be charged with presenting to you a draft of an ethics code that can be adopted by statute so that we can have something that when we get around to enforceable will be enforceable. So we put that in that, we put that in our bill and we have available right now a, a rough, but I think decent draft of a code that could be debated and considered for adoption uh, by statute if and when you wish to do it. I mean, I would love if we could get it on someone's plate this year. I don't know if that would happen, I think, at this late date. Well, we're taking it up next week. Yeah, why not? The proposal to we're on day four his, here, like, authorize his, us. His, well, his bill. <laughs> Okay. Are we talking about S-198? I don't know. Well, we're talking about anything around the Ethics Commission. But the bill, but there, I think what you're talking about, uh, what we're talking about, is the bill would instruct you to come up with the Ethics Code, which would then be debated by the legislature probably next, next year. year. Yeah. Oh, I see. I As see what you're saying. As opposed to debating it this debating year. Debating the, right. the actual code this year. Right. So, so we're taking that and we, yeah. yeah. Maybe we can. Well, if we could. Huh? I mean, we have we'll to work really hard. be delighted if, if we could move it up. Okay. I mean, we asked for, um, authorization to do this in hopes that it would start the discussion. I mean, I don't think anything would please the commission more than to have something substantive actually being discussed now rather than saying, okay, we're putting it on the agenda for next year, which is essentially what we asked for. So that our phase one would be ask us to give you a proposed code and then make some changes to the current statute, um, chapter 31 of Title Three, And the changes that we recommended, I, I can go into this later, it's, it's not detailed, but one of the ones is um, we are in charge of uh, putting out and collecting the executive officer financial disclosure forms. Right. And those forms are to be filled out and submitted biennially. So this year we received the, the forms to cover the year, for the calendar year 2018. The next ones that will be filed will be in 2021 for the year 2020. So if I wanted to give anybody in state government $10,000 and not have it be reported, I should have done it during 2019. The reporting should be annual. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it makes no sense at all yeah. to have biannual reporting. And I've looked through the statutes and the rules of other states. That was probably over, I mean. I, my guess of where that came from is they have candidate disclosures, yeah. and you do those when you're a candidate every other year, and I think they just mirrored that yeah. in the financial disclosure. Yes. Um, I know that in the executive branch, the governor requires them to submit annual disclosures, but if we're going to have it statutorily required, it should be annual. Yeah. It's, a, I think, a fairly easy fix. Yeah. Um, the forms that are used for financial disclosure um, don't have any language on them where the person certifies that I certify this is at least to the best of my belief and information true. So we just ask for language so we can put that on the bottom of the form. The statute outlines what we have to put in the form. We really have no discretion in what's in the form. So as long as it's going to be that way, we're asking that you allow us to put that language at the bottom of the form. Well, we can change the well, we can change that. That. Yeah, yeah, we could change the whole form if it you could if it's a you good idea. Yeah. yeah, so we should make it an annual, and we should at least put the language at the bottom when people sign it, saying, "I certify 
you know, on based on information, belief, et cetera, that this is true. That That's makes sense. Good. Yeah. Um, another uh, change that we're asking for is to change the terms of office of the Ethics Commission members. There are five members. Uh, if we had five-year terms, then only one would time out per year. With three-year terms, we have problems where we could, it, yeah. it really is a mess. So that was another change. Um, another change, um, of course, what was in the news last year was the advisory opinion. Um, and the commission changed its policy on advisory commissions in May um, in, in light of what we'd heard that the legislature and the reaction to the advisory opinion that was issued in 2018. Um, and, and so to comply with what we understood in May to be legislative intent, we changed our policy on advisory opinions so that the new policy is the Ethics Commission will accept a request for an advisory opinion from a public servant, someone who works for the state of Vermont, about their own conduct or their own activities, either current or prospective. Mm -hmm. But no, you know, what people call third party ones. So you, I can't, you can't ask me for an opinion about what Chris Winters is doing or somebody else in government, somebody you outside of government. You often wanted to ask that. Or you I'm could sorry. ask it through Penny. Yeah. After hours. So that eliminates the problem that I think the governor's office correctly characterized as weaponizing uh, advisory opinions. And our understanding was that was consistent with what the legislative intent was, at least as we learned it during the course of last year, as it was made very clear to us. So what we're asking is the statute be changed to clarify that advice given from our office or advisory opinions be limited to requests from people who are subject to the ethics code about their own conduct, current or prospective. So I think it makes sense. Um, that's, that's another big one that we're asking for. In the current statutes, it says that people who are candidates for state office, and I assume that means statewide office or legislative office, um, can't be members of the ethics commission. Um, and I think I, I wasn't here when that was passed, but I'm sure the rationale is since most people running for office have some type of political affiliation that, that's not proper to have them be in the Ethics Commission. That makes good sense. We should extend that to candidates for judicial office, side judges. So we put in an addition to, to put that in. Um, and that brings us to, that's phase one. So ask us to give you an ethics code Phase two would be that we submit a draft code to the legislature so you can consider it. And the code that I've drafted that is, I think, in good enough uh, shape, at least to begin a discussion, doesn't vary a whole lot from what is in our current ethics code. It had, you know, the main things are when you are a public official, a public servant working for the state of Vermont, you, your allegiance is to the state and you need to keep separate your private interests and your governmental interests. So avoid those conflicts of interest. Don't use your office for personal gain. Um, don't speak or do anything um, that either implies or might buy, you know, implies that you're speaking on behalf of the state when you have no authority to do so. Uh, you know, basic, basic things. Um, and then, in, in the proposed uh, ethics code, we put in a proposal that ethics education for state public servants be mandatory. Yeah. We have mandatory sexual harassment training. Yeah. Uh, we should have mandatory ethics training. It doesn't have to be every year, but it should be on some kind of a regular basis. And that should be part of state government. So, you know. People will say, well, okay, fine, we have an ethics code now, if, if we get one. Who's going to enforce it? How's it going to be enforced? And I think my response at this time is, right now we have no enforcement over ethics provisions. Let's wait. Let's get a good code so that there's something to enforce. And then we can have a more detailed discussion about how much of it is going to be enforced against whom, 
and by whom is it going to be enforced? For example, I, I mean, I've looked around at all the different states, and the, the different schemes are kind of mind-boggling. In some states, there is an ethics commission that can uh, impose fines against anybody in state government, including the governor or legislators. In other states, um, there th that's just not allowed. So that the you know the, the governor, the the six statewide officers would be subject to whatever the constitutional provisions are, so impeachment or whatever. Um, and same for uh, legislators. Most states would say, okay, uh, I won't say most states, some states would say if it's a state senator, then the state senate should do it. If it's the House, the House should do it. Um, other states would say if you get a complaint against uh, a legislator, um, then let the Ethics Commission deal with it. Let them have some kind of prosecution. Let them come up with findings and conclusions, and then send it back to the legislature, and they can decide whether or not they want to impose a sanction based on that, or have further hearings. So we could do, if it went that way, we could do the legwork, the hearing, find all the facts, send them to the proper body, and then they would say, okay, we accept it, we reject it, we want to do our own, or we'll decide what the appropriate sanction is, or if it's a recommendation that it be dismissed, then that's the end. So there are a million questions to be asked before we get to that. Who's going to do the actual uh, prosecuting of the cases and the charging of the cases? Who's going to hear the hearing? In some states, they have retired judges who sit and, and do these hearings. Um, in other states, the, the, you know, the uh, Ethics Commission itself would hear these. So there are a lot of discussions to be had about this, and I, I'm sure given two or three weeks, I could come up with a list of questions that should be asked before we could get into any kind of drafting. So my, my sense is uh, enforcement is a future consideration, but our, our current need is to have an ethics code uh, by statute so that people will know what it is, if the public becomes aware of it, and then when we're asked for ethics advice, we have something more than what six people sitting around a, a table think is the right thing for government employees to do. If I were to write or anybody were to contact me and say, I'd like uh, advice about what to do, and I give them advice based on a code that's not enforceable, what protection is that for them? If they follow my advice and somebody, their boss or somebody says, well, I don't think that's right at all. I don't think you should have done that. What protection is there? So at least with the code, I've got something a little more concrete that I can base advice on. Um, so that would be, I, I hope, a step in the right direction. So phase two is to give you a draft of a code that you can discuss and hopefully pass. And then phase three, down the road, would be, okay, to what extent do we want to enforce this and who's going to do it? And right now, you know, I. I'd be happy to have phase two. I'd be happy to have a code that we can work with. Um, what do we do in the meantime? Where are we going and what do we say to our constituents, you know, Vermonters who look to us all the time? I think the sort of fundamental challenge that anybody in state government has is that efficient and state government with integrity has or needs is we need the trust of the people we serve. And I think having an ethics code would go a long step towards raising awareness of ethics in state government and in the public so that they have a better sense, okay, here's what the people who are working for me are doing and are serious about doing. You know, somebody said, was that a partisan issue? You know, are you talking about more government or less government? And I don't think it's more government. I think if you're a person who distrusts government, then an ethics code would be a good thing to have. If you're a person who thinks that government should be a little more involved in things, then ethics code is something you should have. So I hope it's nonpartisan rather than bipartisan. Um, where does that leave the ethics code or the ethics commission? I think what we would like to do is to work and devote our primary attention to ethics awareness and education. If we can do that, I think we can 
decrease the number of complaints that we get. We can raise consciousness among public servants and among the people we serve of ethics. I think we can promote confidence that the government is working for us and not for themselves. Um, and I think that's sort of a win-win for everyone. Um, so that's not very brief, but that's sort of my summary of what we've been up to the last few months and where we would like to go. Um, is it perfect? No. Is it everything that you know everybody might want? Clearly not. Um, but you know we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And if it's a step in the right direction, I think that's better than doing nothing. And so. No matter what you think of the Ethics Commission, whether we have done anything or do do anything or can't do anything or not, at least I think we've been in a unique position to diagnose what the needs are in the state. Um, and so I feel very uh, pleased that we're able to come up with, with a, I think, a reasonable plan. And, you know, I am perfectly happy to, to change it. You know, I don't have any sort of pride of ownership in this. If people have a different way or another way of looking at it, I'm all ears and be happy to do it. But I, I think we have an obligation to do something to make what we have more meaningful. So, to channel my father, a problem clearly stated is a problem half solved. So you have clearly identified some of the problems we need to solve. And at least that gives us a, a, a room. I'm just, before we address the things that I'm just curious, of, of the 23, I think this has been great. I think your testimony was terrific for us and very helpful. Um, the 23 complaints that you've had yeah. all over state government, can you give us a notion of how they were resolved? Were they resolved? Were they, un, uh, you clearly given us a notion that some of them were, you couldn't do anything with, really. They, right. they were. Um, they were, some were closed and not referred. Right. Um, how many were think, actually were? How many? I think there were six that were actually referred for further investigation, discipline, sanction, whatever that would be. Um, at this point, I am unaware that there's been any action other than those being closed by the people we, refer, we referred them to. And of the six that were referred, was oh. action taken? No. In none. No action was taken with those? No. Do you know where they went? Oh, yeah. Where did they go? Um, well, they're in our annual report. So oh, some okay, were referred good. to the AG's office, Department of Human Resources, okay. and Professional Responsibility Board. Okay. Um, and there are reasons for that. Um, one is that, you know, I get the complaint, I can't investigate it. So I look at it and I go, well, gee, this sounds like something that should be investigated, and I send it off. So it may be that it sounds bad, but there's nothing there. I know I can recall one of them specifically that we referred to the AG's office, and they sent back, and they said there's insufficient evidence for us to act on it. Mm -hmm. So I have no way of knowing that when I send it over. So. The fact that nothing happened mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily, I mean, to the complaint, doesn't necessarily mean that the people at the receiving end aren't taking these seriously and doing what they're supposed to. Excuse me. Right. So, Larry, assuming since it was sent to the AG's office, it reached that level of criminal. Well, it was unclear to me, and this was probably my own failing in the, in the early days of my tenure here. I didn't see any obvious criminal violations, oh, okay. but I didn't know if it was regulated by law or maybe there was another statute that they might enforce. So there was nothing that I saw as overtly criminal that I refer to. Okay. So I have a couple questions. First of all, I think that you did what we asked you to do today. So well, thank you. Um, okay. I, I would like to see if we can um, Next week, when we start dealing with this, um, I didn't I didn't realize that the that the bill that Anthony Andrews just asked for permission to do. I would like to come see if we can combine phase one and two, yeah. so that we can actually have a debate about a, a code of ethics because um, and get it resolved. And um, so, in terms of advisory. Opinion. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. I mean, that was the intent. The it was advice to the people who were covered about 
what our actions, right. how they might be interpreted. So my question is, I know there are a lot, you said there are a lot of um, municipal issues and municipal um, requests without thinking about taking those on, would you be able to give and extend the coverage of who you can give advisory opinions to to municipal employees as well as not not yeah. taking the complaints necessarily against them but and doing something with them but giving them so if you're a local select board member I, I could call you and say um, my brother-in-law has a grader can I hire him to to do the roads is that a conflict or how, how would I yeah. handle that um, well as you know each municipality was required to adopt mm -hmm. its own ethics code last mm -hmm. I think July 1st it went into effect uh, and most of them look pretty much the same mm -hmm. um, they use the template did you give them a template no, no they got those oh, that's right. yeah um, so they, they most of them look pretty much the same some are a little more comprehensive than that um, I don't recall any that I've seen that are less comprehensive I sent a letter out to the town clerk saying when you adopt it would you send us a copy just so we could have it they're not required to and, and I think a majority of the towns actually sent them to us it would be difficult for me to give advice based on their various different codes if it was advice based on a statewide code oh. I could do that um, but there are lots of ins and outs of local government that, that I'm unaware of. Um, the problem I see with complaints that we get it is pe the complaints that I've heard is people in town government, select boards or town officials, doing things they shouldn't be doing, not asking for help. Um, mm -hmm. Five or six years ago, there, was, there were quite a few complaints about lawyers and how they dealt with their trust accounts and it was a big problem and mike kennedy when his role changed over the professional responsibility board really did a lot of outreach and a lot of programs training programs around the state to get lawyers aware of what their responsibilities are and the number of complaints has gone drastically down um, so if we had something similar for town some way of having education for municipalities that would raise their awareness then i think a lot of the things that we've heard about i, I would hope that a lot of things we heard about mm -hmm. and secretary of state has heard about would either diminish or go away i mean as i said earlier you know our goal is education and what we don't want to be as an ethics commission is we don't want to be a gotcha organization you know we don't want to be parked off the side of the road getting the first person who goes by at 66 miles an hour on the interstate that's not our goal and our goal is to say here's what the here are the expectations here's how we can help you meet them um, we don't want to send anybody out after you I think a successful program I put this in our annual report the, the best sign of a successful ethics program is a low number of complaints mm -hmm. so if we can put our resources more into education um, then maybe we can achieve that goal um, I would uh, you know our resources are pretty limited right now and uh, I well, we, we ought to be able to influence at least um, some ethics education for incoming legislators when um, through the Snelling Center because the mm -hmm. Snelling Center does all the the orientation mm -hmm. for new legislators and you would think that that would be something that they could incorporate into that yeah. but we could also incorporate it I mean we have annual trainings all the time we could incorporate it into the annual trainings as well and expand right. it I mean, it perfectly I mean it parallels well with the other trainings that we get yeah, yeah, we could do that. Yeah, right? there, there's no need, reason not to do that. I'm just curious, was VLCT not willing to partner with you on educating? We didn't ask. I because mean, because it we me clearly no authority to enter that sphere, yeah. so there was no discussion. Right, but we left out municipalities completely. Yeah. Except for requiring them to do it. 
And I have to say, with our current staffing, I'm grateful for that. <laughs> right, but it strikes me that they would be a, a very good partner on helping the education front on the municipalities. Now that every municipality has a code of ethics, yeah. it is curious we required that, but didn't require it of ourselves. I'm shocked. But do you think that's curious? <laughs> yes, I like consistency, and I guess that piece just missed me. The, 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 well, we required it one place and didn't require it. That's the beauty of my vantage point. I yes, think. that's so where you see some of these things. So, mm -hmm. thank you. You're welcome. Um, speaking yeah. of resources, um, I just want to share a funny thing. One of the the joys of my job being the only person in the office, I get to do a lot of administrative stuff. And I got an email the other day that said, could you send us your organizational chart? <laughs> oh, did you do one? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Good. Isn't it adorable? <laughs> Me and then that's it. Well, and who is currently on the commission? Uh, Julie. Yeah, yeah. Julie, you're right chair. Here. She's the chair. Mm -hmm. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that she plays an enormous role in what we do. I mean, whenever I have a question, she's always there. And she's here for these meetings. Um, I made the work chart. And she made the chart. Oh, she made the chart. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. And Chris Winters will tell you, don't talk to Larry about that. So who, who else is on? Uh, let's see, Paul Erlbaum, who's from East Montpelier. Um, Sarah Bielsi from Danjo, who's from, she's an attorney from Brattleboro. Chris Davis, an attorney from Burlington. And Michelle Ide, who's a CPA, who is from Wheatsfield. Those are the five people. So I just have to say that I, when this came out about how terrible we were, the state of Vermont, I went into the the report mm. and I went into all the questions that they asked and why we came up with things and it was one of those things where it, it made my blood boil a little bit because some of the questions were really didn't pertain to us I, I believe and they, there were questions like what how many fines have you imposed so if you hadn't imposed many fines, you got a low mark. What was the biggest fine that you imposed? And they, they had fines in there like $15,000 or $50,000 or something. Well, we hadn't imposed any fines, so we got a low mark. And it covered a three-year period of time. So, so we didn't even have, we didn't have any grades for those. So I tend not to trust any of those reports that come out. And, and I, I don't trust the ones that come out on um, uh, openness and uh, policies. The, the Sunshine Report that comes out from the, in I think it's February, the Sunshine Report that comes out from the, um, the, pre, the big press association, because the, they ask questions like, do you have a policy about nepotism for your legislative staff? Well, no, we don't have a policy because we don't have legislative staff. Thank you. I mean, individual staff. Right. But we get an F on that question because we don't have a policy. So I tend to think that we should just pay attention to what it is that we need and how we can address it here and just forget about all those horrible reports that come out about us. That's my speech for the day. Well, I agree. I mean, I think what's important is what we think. And mm -hmm. if we see a need to uh, make things better, then we should jump on it. I mean, what I like about mm -hmm. the idea, if we can talk about an ethics code this year, I mean, it's 2020, and you can't turn on the TV or the radio without hearing about ethics mm -hmm. somewhere. And this, to me, is the ideal time to, to grasp this. There should be an ethics code for this national government. Well, they, and they, they, probably they, is. Well, yeah. And you know who ranks really high on some of this stuff? New Jersey. 
I remember Rhode that. Island. Rhode Island. Oh, yeah. Illinois. <laughs> but that's because they're all in jail in Rhode Island. Well, I mean, the they reason they have life. such extensive codes is because they've had to react to so many different kinds of right. of yeah. uh, scandals. And but they still are. I mean, yeah, my brother keeps sending me all the Illinois. Yeah. Every time an Illinois state senator gets indicted on something, I get, an, I get a copy of that article. It's yeah, cultural. What's happening here? It's cultural. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I read recently that I thought was really interesting is they were talking about if you have ethics, you know, viewed with importance at the local level, it tends to trickle up. Yeah. That people who, you know, serve in the legislature, many of them started serving in local bodies or, you know, regional bodies, and then they come up. So if we are eventually able to have a culture of ethics, awareness, and compliance at the local level, it really does filter up. And if people see their representatives, the ones they see every day at home in their towns, behaving ethical, and they trust them, then they're going to trust other people as they go along. Mm -hmm. So it's win-win. And the other advantage of having an ethics code, at least at this point in this proposal, is it doesn't cost a penny to do it. Right. So. Well, we like to pass things that don't cost money. I, I thought you might find that intriguing. And that have big impact. Yeah. Right. Larry, I have another question. I'm not sure I'm going to phrase it very well, but if you could characterize, because up till this point you're the only one, well, maybe not the only one, that's seen the 23 complaints, mm -hmm. how many of them or what percentage of them are kind of like brain dead? Anybody should have known that that just wasn't a proper or appropriate sort of action. Mm -hmm. And how many were, oh gosh, I missed the deadline for filing that form by three days. And technically, that's an ethics violation, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, there were no technical violations. Okay. I didn't see any of those. Uh, so nobody said, my person, my guy didn't do this on time. Um, some of the, I think one of the misconceptions that, that some people have is they believe that anybody, anytime somebody isn't doing their job correctly, that it's unethical. Right. And, and that's a matter of awareness that, you know, if somebody's performing poorly, that isn't necessarily an ethics code violation. That's a different thing. So there were some cases that involved that. There were some legitimate uh, concerns and complaints about conflicts of interest. Um, okay. And, you know, and the problem with conflicts of interest is there are some that are just absolutely obvious on their face and others that aren't. And there's always a line in the middle someplace, and the question is, where does a particular conduct fall? So there were complaints about that as well. Um, so they were kind of across the board. Um, but people get, I mean, conflict of interest, people really get that, and it really rubs, you know. But I some know. of conflict of interest is pretty, Yeah. like if I, if, if I were to testify or introduce or vote on a bill that had to do with housing. Is that a conflict of interest for me? I don't know. I work for a housing organization. Yeah. I, I wouldn't stand to benefit by it, but it is, is that a con no, no, I, I, I don't no, but I think some people yeah. would think that's a conflict. So yeah, I, I don't think, think it's it black or white. I think I don't there's think some so gray either. area there. Yeah. I, well, I think there's, there's gray area, but I think people <laughs> think they understand when they see conflict of interest. I think they feel that they see it. And so to Larry's earlier point, I guess my, the, the thrust of my question was, if we are able to enact a really good educational response to what you saw in those 23, how many of those would be cleared up and people would go, oh, gosh, I didn't realize that I shouldn't oh, have been, okay. that kind of thing. Yeah. Or how many is, hey, I'm going to give you cash under the table, nobody needs to know. I mean, everybody understands yeah. that's not right. I haven't seen those, um, which is good. Uh, the ones that were most troubling were uh, where there was a perceived conflict of interest, uh, at least to the complainant, there was a conflict of interest. Um, other people might agree or disagree, and there, there's a huge area. And I know that with, you know, there, there are different rules, and it defines what a conflict is. Um, and I didn't bring my face to, so I can't tell you what I have there, but, you know, it, not only is there a question of maybe divided loyalty, because usually conflicts of interest come down to your personal interests or the interests of family members or people close to you, versus the general public mm -hmm. interest. Um, so it, it's really hard to articulate that 
any more clearly, but uh, you know the, the conflicts that I saw um, did involve complaints about personal interests versus public interests, um, and there were some complaints of failure to comply with you know, sort of basic municipal. Again, this goes back to municipal. Um, standards of governance, um, some fairly outrageous conduct by local uh, local people, and in those cases, I've referred to complainants as best I could to other people who might help them to counsel. I said, you know, talk to the media, go to legal counsel, talk to. There are, without getting into details, there are some resources available for some of the people who suffered at the hands of of local officials, but it's hard to say. But again, I think, you know, how many people knowingly, willingly engage in unethical conduct? I think that number is very, hopefully, very small. You know, the, the corrupted right. versus the corruptible, maybe, you know, a few in the middle who, you know, normally would do the right thing, but might be enticed into, or not enticed, but for, through ignorance or neglect might engage in something that they didn't realize. Those, that's our primary group. And that's the crowd you'll be able to affect with better education. Yeah, yeah. More and, education. and then there are the incorruptibles who, great, you know, we love them and can't they help us set an example for other people? So, we've got plenty of you want to weigh in? Um, no, I think you've um, captured it quite well. I would only just, just identify that, uh, yourself. Oh, Julie Hilbert, uh, Chair of the Ethics Commission for the Record. Um, I think I would only just reiterate the, the pieces that Larry talked about with education and the discussion that we've had around that. One of the things that I think has been interesting in terms of meeting commissioners from other states is that a lot of states have created their ethics commissions in a state of crisis when the, you know, the public trust was, it, there was irreparable damage to the public trust. And I think we are not there yet, but we're not immune to it. Um, and I think through education and having a statutory code that we can educate to, uh, we can make that there. So that would be the only thing I would add. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, they just had one thing. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, or CAPS, I forget what the acronym stands for, but it's part of the Department of Human Resources, the group that does lots of training for state employees, oh. like if I want to get training on how to use SharePoint or something yeah. on my computer, they, they also offer ethics training. And they, I think they offered three or maybe four this year to anybody in state government who wants to be there. And they usually average 10 or 12 people a class. Um, so if we had mandatory um, ethics education, I hope that yeah. I know they would be able to do it as they have sexual harassment training, they've stepped up and done that. And we certainly would be willing to play a role in that, assist, take whatever responsibility we can, too. I think it's a shared responsibility. We're happy to do our part. Chris? Um, can you know me the scope of your practice? You know, that's what you would call it. For instance, do you, uh, are you ever called into look at any kind of municipal things or only state government, main, mainline state government? By statute, state government. Yeah. Um, but People but hear about us, support. and we've gotten complaints, and and I have to say, I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do, but um, I will be going to the legislature at the end of the year and filing a report, and I'll let them know the type of complaints that we get without identifying an individual, in hopes that someday uh, we can do something to make it, you know, less likely to, to reoccur. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it seems like they're not infrequently they're. Um, Concerns expressed in the press about uh, no bid contracts or the, the handling of bid contracts or um, things like that right, at the municipal level. So yeah, and that's something I know nothing about. Yeah. Right now, worse if, worse if we ignorant about that. I was just curious. You ask people how they found out about you. Yeah, I mean, do people you know that there's nothing submission? They some do. I don't know where they've heard about us. Um, you know, every time we get in trouble for doing something, people hear about us. And, you know, bad publicity is better than no publicity in that regard. Um, All publicity is good. Yeah, exactly. Um, it was interesting. I, I did a, I participated in the training for attorneys who work for the state. It's basically an AG sponsored training for 50 lawyers in throughout state government. And I, I talked briefly about what we do and what we can't do in the gaping holes. And even that group, they were. I had no idea. 
They were shocked to find out there were these gaps. So, um, I have a question about nothing. the. No, no, it's fine. I'm sorry. I have a question about the judicial. The the candidates for statewide office can't be members. Yeah. Or, yeah, for the offices can't be members. And you suggested that we also add judicial candidates. Right. Would that be people who. Um, attorneys who are applying for judgeships? No, they elected, judicial elected office. Judicial so elected office. They would office. only be side so, judges. So, so side and probate. Right. Oh, probate. Right. probate and assistant. Right. Okay, great. That's, I wasn't. No, so candidates sure. for judici yeah. judicial appointment yeah. would not be disqualified. Okay. Okay. Although the minute they were appointed, they would be they an would. eligible yeah. 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 Okay. That's what I. Hmm. I know. I, was, I, I look at this and I, I say, wow. Hmm. What do we do? So, well, we change it. Any more? Well, I just well, I want to thank you. I, I yeah. want to echo the chair's words. Um, I don't know that my position in anything necessarily has greatly changed from what it was, but you have me very interested in, I mean, I'm getting the impression that we gave you a car with three wheels. Or a, oh. a car in a, in a rainforest without any windshield wipers, and you're kind of trying to get along. And so we need to help you. Kind of so I'm impressed with what you've done. I think it's great. Maybe we gave him a go kart or a bicycle. Yeah. Well, I, and I think we're probably not at the point yet where we can give them, give them an electric vehicle, but yeah. we'll, we'll move. <laughs> and, and I don't think the five of us were aware of the gaps that you pointed out. It just was one of those. Well, you don't know. It's an unintended consequence. Yeah. Got to get it going. Phrase and then we in, identify. Now we have somebody terrific. Yeah. Larry. So, yeah. Well yeah. done. Well done. Thank well you. Done. Thank you all. So we will, what day do we have it on for next week? It is Wednesday at 345. Does that work? Um, I have a commitment. I think that I'm supposed to speak to, who am I speaking to? The State Association mm -hmm. and the CPA people, the the ones who appointed one of our members. I'm supposed to see them, I think, at 2.30 or 3. Where? Across the street. Oh, yeah. Apple Plaza. Oh, then can you come yeah. over afterwards? Or sure. Or I'll, I'll see where it is. I think okay. come over earlier or, or, or later, whatever. I hope not meeting that day. That's fine. Yeah. But we can, we can start the discussion anyway. We have your points here. And, and we, you'll have our annual, annual report by then also. And will you have uh, a working draft of a potential um, Understanding that it really is a working draft. Oh, it's very the, much a working draft. Yeah. Code. So we can start even Work looking out. at that yeah. and looking at Anthony's bills and getting testimony from. We'll sure. take a lot of testimony that day. As long as you understand, you may have me over yeah. my 20 hours. This but day. we will. <laughs> <laughs> we What's your overtime arrangement? <laughs> I'm an exempt employee. This is weird. I, I don't know how it works. Um, you know, I have to fill out timesheets, and a couple of times really? I fill them out. Yeah, I don't know why. That's and, crazy. Uh, everybody does. Everybody. And when I've written more than 40 hours for the pay period, a couple of times I've gotten more pay, and then they said, no, you shouldn't do that anymore. You should just write hours over whatever the schedule is. So I do that, and I said, well, where does that go? And they said, well, you get comp time at some place. I said, well, when am I going to use it? <laughs> I can't get my job done in my 20 hours now. What the hell am I going to do with contract? That's crazy. This, it all has to do with the Fair Labor Relations Act. Yeah. And, and when exempt employees fill out their um, time cards, when I work in a, as an exempt employee, I fill it out eight to five, eight hours every day, eight hours every day. If I worked three hours or if I worked 17 hours that day, eight hours every day. Well, right, like and then at the bottom you swear that under the pains and penalties of perjury that it's true. Oh, uh, we didn't have that on our record. <laughs> as, long as, we're talking, as long as we're talking about things that can be fixed, on the forum says, we, the undersigned. And it says, who's the other one? <laughs> Why is it that way? <laughs> That's just me. So I, I think I have my work cut out for me. But we I'm happy to get you something like next week. This is great. Yeah. We will start looking at these, and, and some of these changes are pretty seem to be pretty technical. The phase one and phase two are the big bite, and then these other things really seem to be. Yeah, phase one is, <coughs> is can we give you an ethics code and the tweaks to the current statute, which I think are fairly straightforward. 
phase two will be the actual draft. Yeah. Well, um, and we can get that, I can get that to you hopefully by Wednesday. Good. And then mm -hmm. phase three will be down the road when we yeah. have lots of discussions about what the future should be. Mm -hmm. Good. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, we have a couple people who have meetings at 3.30.